five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. You're listening to Tabletop and Beyond with your host, Justin. But before we get started, how was your geek week? And co-hosts, Dan and Jason. You have to be willing to let the dice help you tell the story. Okay, look, this year, I'm going to stop mispronouncing words. Join us as we cover board games to war games and beyond. And welcome back to Tabletop and Beyond. I am your host, Justin. I am here with Dan and Jason. Welcome to the show, boys. Hey. Thanks for having us, as always. So, obviously, with Dan Herrera in the house, this is our Winnie Warcry uh, segment of the podcast, and we are excited today to talk about the Gen Con tournament that just happened last weekend, as well as all the new revelations and information that we have been getting uh, out of Warcry 2.0 uh, just ahead of the release of the uh, Gur, uh, Warcry Gur box that I'm calling it. So uh, we're, we've are we got a lot to talk about today. Before we get to that, though, let's see what's on the hobby table. Jason, what's on your hobby table right now? <laughs> Not much because I took it all to Gen Con. <laughs> but, uh, I was wondering about that. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't made its way back onto the shelf uh, yet. But, uh, or back onto the table yet. But, um, I mean, I still have, um, I painted up the core set of my Deep Madness core box. Okay. But I haven't, um, so all of the minis that go along with that, even the heroes and the the horrors. But I haven't painted the bosses that came in that set yet. Probably because we've never played the game well enough to actually get to a boss. But um, I'm going <laughs> to paint it so that we can do it. That'll be our objective. So that's that's actually something that's still sitting on my table from when I left for Gen Con, was to get the bosses for the core set of Deep Madness painted up. It's funny, too, because when, um, when I went by Dimension Games' booth at Gen Con, they, I was telling them about how I'd finally gotten my core set painted up, and they were like, oh, well, just so you know, we've got another expansion for Deep Madness coming. <laughs> yeah. like, I've already got your five other expansions. I might wait on this one, but we'll yeah. see. And and for those listeners uh, who are wondering which War Cry box Deep Madness is, is <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> that's not one of them that's out there. That's actually what uh, – man, that was a Kickstarter game from how long ago, Jason? Uh, I don't know, man. It's been like five years, five, six yeah. years. Yeah. So it's kind of like a um, – cooperative. it's a cooperative survival game. Uh, deep um, down in the uh, – you know, down at the bottom of the ocean, a derelict uh, science station. But uh, and, I kind of think Bioshock, but uh, with cosmic horrors running running loose. Yeah. Nice. And and how many minis came in that first box? Um, let me see. I think it was like 60, 60 or seventy. Yeah. I think it was seventy. I think it was seventy in the front. I think I have five boxes of them. So or four four boxes of them. But that. Um, that took a pause while I finished my, uh, my Ogre Warcry, um, Warband, which I did get done in time, just in time to jump on in the car and head to Gen Con. Uh, but I don't have any Warcry on the table now since it's still packed up in my box. I believe that your, um, wife had a hand in you finishing, right? <laughs> she did. She did. <laughs> I was packing and I was getting everything ready for Gen Con the day before we left. And I was kind of chilling, kind of walking around the house like, all right, I'm all ready to go. She says, uh, don't you have some painting you have to do? And I was like, oh, crap. Like I had forgot, totally forgotten to paint the Yeti. Oh, no. <laughs> so I ran down there and finished basing them and painting them. So thanks to my wife, I had a fully painted warband at Gen Con. That's right. That would have been a, a very rushed morning had you oh, forgotten yeah. that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's fine. You just dip it in, dip it in the Army Painter Strong Tone and call it a day. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> uh, Dan, how's your hobby table? Good. I am trying something I've never tried before, which is uh, hobbying while podcasting. We'll see how it Ooh. goes. Oh, yeah. Currently, as we speak, gluing the, uh, what would you call it, the shanks onto the body of a tempester, um, like the little dra Dracothian riders, essentially. Dracothian guard riders. So I'm gonna uh -huh. take some tempesters. You can't 
play them in Warcry, but I'm going to try them out in uh, Age of Sigmar at Nova. Um, just finishing the last of my Stormcast, waiting for, honestly, waiting for like brewing sessions to decide what I'm going to bring, you know, and have to finish painting for the Warcry portion. So I haven't even decided that yet. At least I can get started finishing my Age of Sigmar army. So I can just have a few left to paint. Nice. Um, I I have like 40 Dreadscythe Herodons I need to paint. And I'm hoping that I can get it done before before Nova Open. I think I can, but I realize that I am running out of time. So um, thank goodness for the airbrush, right? And uh, I use the airbrush before on the ghosties, so um, I think it'll be I think it'll be okay. But it just uh, it's it's a lot, and I'm like, if I don't finish this, what am I gonna do? Because like my whole list is centered around the Dreadscythe Herodons. <laughs> so you For... are gonna finish them, is what that means. So exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it it'll it'll be kind of crazy. I don't know if I'm gonna end up with a display board. Are you bringing a display board? No. For Age of Sigmar? No. Yeah. I don't I don't yeah. even like them. When I see other people's display boards, if they're really, really good, then I like them. But for the most part, I don't know. I just think the army looks better just like on the battlefield on the table. Um Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we maybe we just lost a bunch of display board loving listeners. But <laughs> I'm just I'm not about them. It just it's so much more transport and so I just feel like it's player unfriendly. But the people who do really amazing ones, they are pretty incredible if it's like if it fits really perfectly. I remember seeing a um what was this? It was like a Karadran Overlord's army where their display board was actually an oil drum that they had sawed in half and put little like platforms inside so that it was like they were living in a mine, you know, so that um and then they had turned the mine into like a um, rave mine and he had painted a lot of like neon onto the onto the Karadran overlord so it was this really wild like essentially turning his entire army into a diorama when people do that i get really impressed but when it's just kind of um you know like i would just be bringing a slab of wood that i wouldn't be able to get on the plane anyway right so Right. Yeah. I had a um I had a little board. I put a little mausoleum like on an elevated thing and I had some like um grave headstones, you know, that I had kind of glued to the oh, board. Mm -hmm. And like it was okay. It did its job, you know what I mean? I was just trying to get the painting points for the soft score, you know, like yeah. do you have a display board? Is it thematic? Um, and then on the way home from LVO, like, I think a TSA agent opened up my bag and just wrecked it. Oh. Like, <laughs> and so I was like, well, there goes that board. So, um, I, I was thinking I might try to repurpose it. I've got a, I mean, obviously I got the mausoleum stuff that I had painted up for Warcry. So maybe I just put a bunch of stuff on a board and, and do something with that. So I well, don't know. We'll see. That's not a bad idea, actually. Just using Warcry boards as display boards, or like you fold a Warcry board in half and just use part of it as a display yeah. board with just put a Warcry terrain. Oh man. Okay. Now I'm actually thinking I could do it because like you could actually transport a Warcry board, um, right? And you'd only need a couple terrain pieces then. They just have yep. to fit your army. I don't think any of my Brain currently fits my army very well, but that's a great little concept right there. Yeah, I think I think I'm gonna try to repurpose, you know, and see what I can do because I I just don't have time to like go all in on this. So, and I have no illusions that I'm gonna be winning like best painted or like most creative display. So, uh, the question is is how how much do I want to put into it? <laughs> you know what I mean, like. I'll put a little bit into it, but like I'm not gonna try to kill myself um, before before this tournament. Like the priority is obviously painting the models to get them on the field. So anyway, we'll see how it goes. So that's that that's mine ahead of, ahead of where I'm at. So yeah, very good, very good. Well, let's uh, let's talk about Gen Con. So first off, Gen Con was amazing. Uh, Dan, you got to come with us next year. <laughs> I would like to. It just uh, it popped up 
kind of at the worst time for me, actually. But yeah, I was I was very jealous of it. Got to go. So we uh, rented a VRBO that was probably like a what a twenty five minute walk from the convention center, Jason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ooh, so you got and, your steps in. Yep. Yeah, which is good. It was so funny because I saw a tweet today that was like, "How did I walk like eight hundred thousand plus steps over the weekend and still feel like I gained ten pounds?" And yeah. like that's how I feel. Like I'm like <laughs> I walked so much, but it's just you're just like gaming and not sleeping great and. I mean, I I slept well, just not enough, probably. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, so we had a VRBO. Uh, it was about a twenty-five minute walk. Um, and man, we had a lot of games, a lot of RPGs, a lot of board games, and then obviously the Warcry tournament. Yeah, so it so, was a lot of fun. So let's flip hosting duties for a second. So uh, let's yeah. uh, let me get some questions in here. Um, I want to ask you both. Like, let's start with your list. What like what were your last minute changes to it, and uh, you know what were you hoping for with the list before we start? So uh, let's go, uh, Justin. Let's start with you. So the list, and you're familiar because I've been talking your ear off about this with, with my Stormcast list, right? Um, so it's the Stormcast Warrior Chamber list. Uh, it had uh, the Lord Relictor is the leader. There, I only had one leader. Uh, I had a prosecutor with uh twin hammers uh i had two protectors and i had a paladin with a star soul mace uh so this is a change from the list that i developed for my cousin back in the huzzah hobbies one because he had a um uh lord castellant uh in his list instead of the prosecutor which lord castellant gave like five attacks which was great but you couldn't really get him to where he needed to be to deliver those attacks. So I decided to swap him out for the Prosecutor, which was a very wise move. I, I needed that extra movement to be able to challenge where I needed to be. I was worried about some um, kind of like leader takedown missions yep. uh, that we had. Even though we got the pack a- ahead of time, like I, I just wanted to make sure that like, yeah, I needed, I wanted to be able to project power with that, with that Prosecutor. So um you know he moves 10 inches with his base he's got toughness five uh oh no toughness six oh no sorry toughness five and then um he uh he's got like four four melee attacks three range attacks at uh strength five maybe four but um yeah like he's uh he he's really good Really, really, really good, and um, he gave me the mobility I needed to win some games for sure. So, um, nice. I, I was very happy with this list. Uh, the, the the other key thing is that the protectors in there. I think I mentioned this before, but they're they only have a three inch movement base, but they have a three inch ra- uh, melee range, which really effectively gives them a a six inch. You know, like if they're standing somewhere with their wide bases, they kind of have a six inch or seven inch bubble. Of threat range, so if you have two of them overlapping, you you've got a good control of the board there, with them. Um, and then uh, then the uh, paladin with the star soul mace is just an absolute like beat stick. Like that dude, if you can get him in, it, you know he does base damage four, critical hit, uh, critical damage eight, and um, he's he's swinging three attacks and almost all the time. He's hitting on threes, so like that that dude would like knock things out pretty hard if you could get him to where he needed to be. Nice. So oh, and then with the Lord Relictor, um, I liked him because he has an ability to call down lightning, and basically you pick an enemy within twelve inches on a triple, you take the value of that dice, and um, you are able to roll the value of that dice and on a two up it's one damage so a lot of times i was getting fives and six fives and sixes for doubles and then turning that into triples so i'm rolling five or six dice and it's doing four or five damage every time or uh yeah four or five six damage every time you know cool so so that's yeah, every was, model really um all right so then uh let's go to jason so i know you played ogres um tell me about this ogre list because you've been kind of tinkering with it kind of beating up justin with it over the years 
Exactly. <laughs> Tell me how you got to uh, how how you got to this final version of it. Yeah. So finally, um, you know, the last time I we played a tournament, I brought my two uh, Thunder Fist, Lead Belcher, two Frost Sabers, and three Nobblers. Well, not two Nobblers and Bushwhacker, which is basically a Nobbler with a little trap. Yep. And um, at that uh, at the last tournament before Gen Con, you know, I found I really really loved the movement of the Frost Sabers. Right, they got an eight movement. Uh-huh. Um, and their, I would say that their profile was such that they were pretty survival, right? They were kind of an average, you know, fours across the board and enough enough wounds to kind of stay alive when they're on there. So you could kind of get them in the way. You could use them to you could use them to get somebody engaged to try to steal an action from someone that was down street, uh, downfield that might try to move in on an objective uh, and force them to have to take a disengage if they want to do something. Uh-huh. Um, but... Um, but I had a ton of points left over, but I couldn't squeeze. I couldn't feel like I could squeeze a model in. Well, I think with you know talking with you and, and helping with some other folks a little bit, I said, well, let me upgrade that that lead belcher to another thunder fist, since you can take a, a you can have a leader and a second hero, um, and that balanced the points out so that I could turn one of those frost sabers into a yeti. And uh, I'll tell you, I was really hoping that when I got there, I was worried. I was worried that the yeti gave me the same movement profile of eight but his base was really big he has like a 50 mil millimeter base yeah versus the frost saber which is like that oval t- kind of kind of small oval base i don't even know what it is but the uh, i'll tell you um i every game i used the yeti's uh bounce where if you end a move if you end a move with an enemy fighter within six inches you can spend a double and he'll he can jump six inches to a fighter catch it yep to catch it, I used that every game. And every it, single it one was every single game, and it was so useful. And I would, and there were multiple times in the tournament where I used that fifty millimeter size base to block people from going places. So I'd run up, I'd get within distance, I'd spin my double, I'd jump, and I, I'd, I'd place the yeti with his base such that he would block the enemy from being able to disengage in the direction he wanted to go. And then I'd still get a free swing in. Or not a free swing, I'd get my last action, yeah, yeah. my swing in. But, awesome. I mean, multiple times that 50 millimeter base got in the way of, you know, blocking you know, down, a, down like a channel or something. Uh, so, man, if I could fit two Yetis in, I would. Now, the prices are changing for two, and we'll get there a little bit later uh, tonight probably. But uh, the Thunder Fist did exactly what the Thunder Fist should do, right? They melted people off the table with their shots. I mean, just super powerful in, in 1.0. Um, and the Nobblers, the Nobblers did what the Nobblers do, right? They just run out there and they, they get blown off the field in one swing. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that's their purpose that, in life. That's their purpose. And the Bushwhacka, I'll tell you this about the Bushwhacka. It's a gimmick, right? Okay. Every game that I've played with him, um, I throw his trap down. Um, all it does is really make my opponent pause. And, I, you know, maybe that's, that's what it's worth is, but, uh, you know, you throw a tiny little 25-millimeter base down with a trap, uh, and it just kind of makes them walk around it a little bit. But yeah. uh, I, I think it can be... It's definitely worth it if I'm, like, at the end of my turn, I've got a double left over, and I don't know what to do with it. But you kind of also have to get it out, like, in like the first turn of the game because Bushwhack is going to die the first time he touches something. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure if it's necessary, but the fact of the matter is Bushwhacker was cheaper than a normal Nobbler, so he was still worth bringing. Yeah, yeah. Would you have, if you were doing it over, would you have taken a regular Nobbler instead? Uh, No, because it was five points. I mean, oh, the you only didn't have room. Th- he, well, so a Nobbler, yeah, I didn't have room. A Nobbler's 45, at least under 1.0 rules. So Nobbler's 45 and Bushwhacker's 40. Right. Yeah. So I'm saving five points, and the only difference is he swings for one less in his. He's got one less attack characteristic than a normal nobbler. So that's the trade to get the trap and save five points. Okay. So I didn't really think it mattered. I didn't have enough points to do anything else with my list, so I kept him just to kind of get in the heads of my players. Fair enough. And then, so your round one, then Jason, who did you face, and what were they? What were they on? Yeah, so the, my round one um, was a really, really fun guy. He was, uh, God, I don't remember, I don't remember where they were from, but he hadn't played Warcry in a long time, and he brought kind of a, 
kind of an early an early war band. He brought an unmade war band. Okay. And um, I'm not. You guys are really good at kind of knowing what everything's called. I don't really know what everything's called, but he had what you would expect to have in an unmade band, like band, which you saw kind of on the front of the box. So it yeah. kind of looked like he took the box and just brought the box to the table, you know? Okay. Um, I felt it's one of those where uh, I felt a little bit bad uh, for him because they just, they were so squishy uh, when compared to the Yeti and the uh, Thunder Fists. I mean, Thunder you Fists know, are just designed to blow those... Um, and they to did blow those they, folk bands off the board, aren't they? And then they absolutely did. They just blew them. I think we played the match where you have uh, two objectives, and the first at the end of the first round, if any player owns both objectives, they win at the end of any round. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, like I just I popped a yeah you know, it was sudden I, sudden death. Yeah, I just I popped one of my thunder fists on one of the objectives. And then he just sat there while the other Thunder Fist and Yeti just ran around the board and eliminated his war band until I could control the other one. Wow. <laughs> it was pretty it was pretty straightforward. I think I think he played a really difficult list. There wasn't a lot of damage output um across his army and they were kind of squishy. The unmade, I think, are really unforgiving, right? Because they've got a few abilities that are meant to sort of soften things up for the leader to then go kind of um crazy bouncing around killing a bunch of stuff but you have to kind of align the stars i think really well like i don't know you i think you have to really practice and i think you got to get a little lucky you know with your opponent maybe not knowing how to play around it but you, you do and you, and and i think you have to pay attention in war cry right i still think movement is the one of the most important characteristics of sigmar and also in war cry yeah. or any objective based game and no, I think you look at a Thunder Fist or a Lead Belch or whatever, and you say, "Gosh, those guys can do massive damage." I'm gonna, I'm gonna run my guys away to try to stay out of range. Um, but then you forget about the objective. And my opponent, uh, good, good guy. We we had a really fun game, but at one point, um, I think he was kind of trying to stay out of my threat range of my shot. Yeah. And when he backed up out of my threat range, I said, "Okay." And so I spent a double, gave my guy plus one move, and I just double moved right and, and and squatted right on the objective and he could never get me off of it at that point oh wow okay i think I, the fear of the belcher kind of uh adjusted the gameplay a little bit and then i didn't even use it but it's a you know i'm interested to see what the 2.0 rules will do for things like the unmade those early bands yeah yeah there's some pretty big changes to some of them others didn't really get that many changes um so yeah, it should be interesting to see if people keep playing them. Um, or if we just get a million, you know, 2.0 bands and then, yeah. <laughs> and then people kind of move to those just out of wanting the new yeah. bands. Yeah, so Dan, just to kind of answer your question in a quick summary, um, the Yeti, I think, was a huge improvement in my list because of that bounce and his big base. Being able to, to kind of jump and then use that base to block was very helpful yeah i bet all right so then uh justin i assume you also played around one uh <laughs> how <laughs> yes, did, did how did you go so i assume it was on sudden death as well right everyone played the same yep. round everyone okay so, yeah uh, it, it was sudden death the twist that we had was add one to the uh, attacks and strength characteristics of all fighters in this battle with one or more damage points allocated to them which is kind of a cool. I like that twist a lot, right? Like, so if you're damaged, you're doing more attacks and stronger attacks. So, yep. uh, there's obviously there's two objectives, as uh, Jason mentioned, and you got to place the objectives. Like, I put one down, and my opponent, and I, I'm I should remember her name it was like um, Ariane or something like that. Um, she put it down. She was playing the Untamed Beasts, um, and so basically. Ours were like completely diagonal across the board from each other. Like uh, you had to put the you had to put the objectives within anywhere on the board um, six inches away from the board edge. So where there was like a little corner, you know, like we kind of put ours like complete opposite corners. And okay. um, so what I ended up doing is I put my shield. My shield was across the board. Um, like uh horizontally 
from her. Well, so I was I, I basically where my shield was. It was probably like six inches away from where um, her objective was, mm-hmm. and uh, my hammer and dag my dagger was on came on to where my um, objective was, and uh, my dagger had my paladin and my lord relictor in it. And my hammer had the prosecutor in it, and that came in round two on one of the board edges. Um, and so my shield had the two protectors in it. And so um, what ended up happening, and I had to be very, I had to be careful that I didn't give up too much on turn one because it could have, I, it could have been all over on turn one, right? So I had to be, I had to be super careful that. Um, that I didn't allow them to just swarm me in that one. But she had put quite a few models in her hammer, so that prevented her from overtaking the number of models needed for the the dagger, that I, where I had my dagger, my two models on my dagger. So, um, but she had overwhelmed, like in terms of raw numbers, she'd overwhelmed my shield. Now, in terms of power, there's no way she overwhelmed those two protectors, right? Because she had like, um, through two of her shield, run, uh, two of her planes runners there, um, and uh, one of the, it wasn't the Beastmaster. It was, was one of the other list, ones. Uh, was her list the kind of double cat list? Or no, she, she didn't have the double cat more list. Like she had the Beast the Speaker. Box. Okay. She did have the Beast Speaker. She it was pretty much a straight box. Okay. Of you know, um, and she said she's really new to the game. Um, she played a great game for being like pretty new, um, but uh, like there's the problem was is there just wasn't anything that those untamed beasts could do to the Stormcasts, right? They're hitting on fives and sixes. A lot of the crits are only doing like two, maybe three damage if she got them. So honestly, like at the end of the day, like I think I won in turn two. Um, maybe turn, maybe turn three, uh, it's probably turn three and then, um, or sorry, round three. And really like, I was just like, kill, kill, kill. And then she'd swing back and it'd do like one or two damage. I think my storm cast took a total of eight damage, like the whole game. Sure. Like she just couldn't, she just couldn't hit, hit me. Um, because she was hitting fives and sixes all the time. Right. So um it it wasn't um the 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 tricky thing for me was making sure i didn't get overwhelmed on one of the objectives in turn one but by by the end of turn one like it was pretty clear that that game was not going to um go in their favor just because i had killed the protectors had ended up killing like the two plans runners that were contesting like right away like in one attack um like each and so yeah, it All just right. so it sounds yeah. like you guys both kind of breezed through. I mean, not breezed because you know there's still there's still games to be played, but you you guys were both your warbands were pretty effective in round one. So then, what was yeah? Uh, what was the scenario on round two? And uh, round two, yeah, round two was from the Toma Champions, um, and it was Fleeting Glory. Oh yeah. So okay, Love yeah. That so one. that's no got... need to explain. Yeah, um, that's a great. That's a. It's a great mission. I really like this I think one. It's my so. favorite mission. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it's We're, in the uh, six match play sort of tournament missions in um, in the new core book too. Uh, they have a different name for it, but it's very very similar. Which is cool. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so, Dustin, how about really you just good. keep going? What was your? Who was your round two opponent? Okay, so this was against Riley Bender. Um, and she's a really good player, by the way, this was maybe my, this was actually the closest match I had of the whole tournament. Uh, I was playing against Skaven. Uh-huh. Um, Riley had one rat ogre, two pack masters, a claw Lord, two, uh, plague monks with fetid blades, and then filled out the rest of it with a bunch of giant rats. So there's probably like six of them. Okay. Something like that. So it was definitely a swarm list. Um, she had some beef uh, with the rat ogre, uh, but like it, 
the the hardest thing for me was countering these little giant rats stealing objectives. <laughs> yeah, of right? course. So, <laughs> so that was hard. So, um, I, I went with my. I mean, obviously, I had the same. You know, the shield had my two protectors. My dagger had my relictor and um, and paladin, and then my hammer had the uh, prosecutor. So round one, right? There's the three objectives there. I knew, I knew that I was not going to be able to long term win this game if I tried to compete at the edge uh, objectives, yep. right? Because um, if they chose one to get rid of, I wouldn't hit. Like you choose, if you choose one of the edge ones to uh, get rid of, then like the. If I try to compete there with my Stormcast, I would not be able to get them to the middle in time, sure. right? So um, what I ended up doing is basically the shield, I had my Paladin run for one of the objectives where the Rat Ogres were close to yep. and just basically tie them up, tie that group up for at least one turn up there. Right, and then I had my Lord Relictor run to the middle and start blocking out, and then I had my two Paladins come down, and basically double move and start blocking out down there, and then I had my Prosecutor, I completely flew over the objectives and I landed next to their group, the group, uh, her shield, that had a, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, Packmaster, a bunch of big ra uh, giant rats, and a um, Plague Monk in it. And I landed right next to them, and then I just started to go to work on the giant rats, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm like, I need to, I need to reduce their numbers, and I'm giving up access to this objective. So she obviously moved and captured the objective and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm was just trying to reduce numbers, yeah, um, because I needed to do that to maintain the middle, right? And so she removed uh, an objective down there. Um, that where my prosecutor was and um, I think she realized in turn two like oh he wasn't really contending that you know and she started to see it play out but it was like a slow motion train sure. wreck because my paladin up top like destroyed the um, absolutely destroyed the uh, the plague monk and like two two rat giant rats up there yep. so all that was left was the um uh the rat ogre you know and and like i'm not scared of that paladin going toe to toe with the rat ogre you know like let 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 him waste a couple of turns killing that paladin i'm totally fine with that if it's going to prevent him from getting to the middle in time to do anything about it Sure. You know, so I was basically sacrificing him. So anyway, throughout the rounds, like I, I ended up basically boxing out with my big stormcast bases that metal uh, that center objective, and even when Riley was able to sneak a rat in to e start contending, the paladins' reach would just tag them and just destroy them. So it was able to reach over like the like they get base to base with the Lord Relictor and be just barely within three inches of capturing the objective to contend it. But then the paladin would just reach over and be like, boop, you're dead, boop, you're dead, you know? And so um, they did a really good job of boxing out and, and, and playing keep away. So round one, I gave up three points, right? Round two, I gave up uh, four points because two objectives were worth two points. So we're talking, I'm down seven points. Oh, going so into round three tying on yes oh interesting yes. yep so that'll be so a fun then... change when we start getting to uh second edition yeah okay yeah so you exactly tied on so... points but one on kill points well so what happened is we had enough time to force a fifth round and um i ended up killing uh like at least one of her models on fifth round and i had three there and she was not going to do anything to kill my models um, right. Just because they had enough health on it, and so that was the end of the game. So, um, but it was a gamble, and it, I was sweating at the end of round two because I'm down seven points, right? Yeah, like, yeah. you know, and I'm sitting here going like, "Oh my gosh, did I make the right choice?" And like, my my heart is like, "You've got this. Stick with the plan. You're doing it." But my brain's like, "You <laughs> idiot! What are you doing? You gotta go attack them. You gotta go kill." And I'm like, "No, stay on the objective. No, go yeah. kill them." You know, <laughs> like, and I'm playing this like internal battle as I'm watching 
things play out because she was really good about with her movement and like really getting in there and just tagging that objective. Like she'd be like 2.9 inches away from that objective, you know, and I just had to like kill, kill, kill. And fortunately the storm cast had the damage to, you know, if they did a double swing, especially those, those protectors, they did a double swing. It would kill pretty much anything that they touched, you know? So, um, it was just, right. it, you know, if cinematically you're talking like these protectors got these big spears and they're just like skewering rats left and right as they're like coming <laughs> at them, you know? The and... <laughs> one cinematically that I'm most interested in is the uh, paladin who nobly sacrifices himself to the rat ogre so that the rest of the, so that the rest oh. of the storm cast could get it done. It was amazing. He, he just was at like, he was just there taking a beating and I thought that she would get more damage on him. But the thing is, is um, the paladin, I knew that the, um, that the uh, uh, pack, not the pack rat, the pack master was going to like stoke him. Right. So right. I said, I used my paladin and I said, kill that one first. Even if I, even if that makes, means me taking a beating from the rat ogre, I, I don't want him getting that bonus attack on me, you know, because that could that could be really bad. So I killed that one first, and then you know just took a couple beatings. But yeah, it was pretty pretty epic having that paladin do the showdown with the rat ogre. Yeah, absolutely. So, All right. Yeah, and then that was uh, really good. It was a very close game. Very close game. She was a great player. Yeah. So Jason, how did uh, how did Fleeting Glory go for you? What did you play against? Who'd you play? Against? Well, um, I think Justin did a good job explaining uh, the actual uh <clears throat> objective based thing you know you got three and you got to burn two of them get burned before the end of the game so you're kind of fighting over one of them there right i played and i can't remember his name you'll remember his name instantly it's the guy who won a catacons war cry uh with his um justin uh justin O. yes oh sure yes, justin O. <laughs> with his yep. all volley guns list <laughs> yeah so he brought the keratin overlords and um and it was. It was just an all-shooter list. Uh, he said he wanted to see – this is funny. He says, I want to see if I can win a tournament with the slowest army in the game. <laughs> <laughs> he told me that, too. He was like, well, I won a tournament with the fastest army in the game. I need to try to do it with the slowest army now, which I thought was really funny. Because KO doesn't have to be the slowest army. They've got a ton of flyers in there and everything. Yeah. But uh, the way he ran it, it was definitely the slowest. He, he yeah. told me that too, and aside from my prosecutor, I'm like, I'm right there with you, buddy. No, prosecutor's you know? cheating. You don't even get to say exactly. aside from the prosecutor. <laughs> uh, uh, exactly. But everybody else was three inches. <laughs> yeah, so it was uh, it was a good fight. Um, another one of those where you know they kind of they're kind of they're kind of trick ponies at times you know if they get their leader in a certain position he can give them just an absurd number of shots right uh, uh, but they kind of have to be in those positions to do that right they have to, i think it's they have to be on or near an objective for him to give that ability or something like that but uh, right so sometimes it's actually kind of tough for them to get there because they've got to run yeah. you yep. know all the way across the board yeah yeah so i think you know it kind of typical as you think it would plant play out right whenever i look at this i love this um i love this uh, uh match type and whenever i look at it i always think all right where is the final stand gonna be and it, you know yep. i would say most of the time for me that i've played it it usually ends up in the middle just because of the way the um deployment scheme works uh and in this case it did too um you know i let him have i kind of kite and I knew he's a good player, and I knew he was just trying out a list. So I'm not going to take really too much credit on this one. Um, but uh, I kind of kept one of my Thunder Fists in the back corner near an objective I had no intention of ever capturing. Sure. Just to kind of draw him. And I think it did a little bit. He got a little bloodthirsty because he kept getting frustrated that he couldn't kill it because I had uh. so many hit points. <laughs> yep. So he he kept focusing on it while I just moved into the back onto um, one of the other objectives and also moved Moved into the back and doing a back objective, but also positioned myself to be able to very easily get to the center objective. And, um, you know, I think having his list have a very small movement was very difficult for him to play this this type of match. Um, right. Because of where your hammer and where your dagger and your shield pop out with only a three-inch movement, um, he really 
it forced him to double move and with really only shooters you really can't sacrifice that movement if you want to try to control the models on the board so it was a very hard match for him but he was a really good player he tried to at the end when he knew that he wasn't going to win the primary he tried to bait me outside of the secondary uh points mm -hmm. uh, i recognized what he was doing because he would he would position them in a way that I could move to take crack shots at him if I wanted to, but it would push me off of objective, at which point then he could potentially fly in and, and contest an objective away from me. Um, but I didn't take the bait. I, I kept made sure I always had at least one additional model there, and I ended up taking the win. But he did, he did, uh, keep, he did do really good movement that kept me from being able to take his leader down, so I missed the secondary point of taking down your opponent's uh, leader. He, at the end when I was, I was really gonna be able to take him with one more shot and he did a double move and just got within, he got outside of my melee, but within three so that I couldn't use my uh, gun on him. And I, my guy was positioned just far enough out that I didn't, I couldn't move to get that additional inch without losing the objective. So I just had to give up that point. So that All was right. a good match. Nice. So at this point, you're both 2-0. and You've gone from breezing. You've both essentially had the exact same tournament, right? You've gone from breezing through your first round to uh, just barely squeaking one out against uh, someone who went undefeated at Adepticon. And so now you, you've both got to be feeling pretty good at this point, right? You're both threats to win the tournament starting <laughs> so so you say that but the, honestly like the difference between i think those who won and those who lost even after the first round like you could tell like it's kind of that that first tranche of winners like those were the people who had really played before yeah you know what i mean and you could tell um that that like that was a that was a new category that's the next tranche of winners um was and I think there's only four of us, right, Jason, that were 2-0? Yeah. and oh? Yeah, and yeah. I think you and I both looked at, at it. We were like, well, somebody's either doing gits or somebody's doing spiders, and it's going to be tough. Yeah, exactly. We both did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, right, and so, like, we knew. essentially in the semifinals, right? Um, yes, exactly. Yeah, so interesting. So, okay, so one of you played against gits, and one of you played against spiders, and you kind of knew that that's what, that's what was going to go down. Yep. Um, so let's start with the gits. Cause I thought that that gits list was interesting. Who played against the gits first? I did. Okay. I played Peter who is, uh, I've played him now twice. He came to our, uh, he came to our Huzzah Hobbies tournament down yeah. from Pennsylvania. So a dedicated player, really friendly guy, such a fun guy to play across the table. He, he's always making you feel like you're doing your best, you know, just to, and that you're doing everything you can. That's one thing I really like about you know, that's one thing I really like about a good opponent is they 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 help you feel like you're doing your best uh, mm -hmm. at a game, even in the competitive setting. And Peter's that so kind wholesome. of a guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. Um, he is awesome. He is, but he also has a ridiculous list with, uh, and he seems to whenever I play him, and I've only played him twice, he seems to just roll those quads nonstop. And yeah. Uh, that's really what happened. We played um, we played the one where you have to run from one side of the map to the other, try Scour. to escape. Yeah, Scour, which I'm, I know I got, I got, and I will say, uh, you know, I'll cut to the chase, I did lose, uh, but um, I just don't know if I really like this, this match, but yeah. uh, I'm not sure I like it, but that's okay. The way that the shield, um, the way that the deployment was where I had my, you know, my warband split up, only one of my Thunder Fists was on the table at the beginning, and it was positioned perfectly for one of his hoppers to get to it if he got a quad and he got a quad and i was oh, like well no. he's gone there's yeah. nothing i can do and so i did what i could i took the initiative like when it was my turn i went with my thunder fist and i popped off one of his little guys to try to get a point on the board yep. and then sure enough he used his quad and he hopped you know almost halfway across the map and just took my almost took my thunder fist out in one hit and finished him up in the next activation because that yeah. gets quad for those who don't know it's more than just a rampage you know rampage is amazing it's like better than almost every yeah. quad in the game but the gets one is actually just like a huge upgrade over the regular rampage yeah um so for anyone in the audience who doesn't know that's that's probably what happened i assume right you just got oh yeah um gets <laughs> quadded and <laughs> really i got gets quadded i love it gets quadded yeah. and um at that point, I realized, 
and I, maybe I played the tournament a little, I mean, this is a learning experience for me. I, I was going for the, I said, look, if I'm going to win this match, I can't follow the main objective. I've got to kill his guys for points because he's just going to hop around and pop my little guys off um, before I can run them off of the map edge. Um, and I'm, I know I'm going to be down because I was just banking on the fact that he was going to get quads because he, oh, and, and he did. He got more than one in that okay. match and he had three hoppers on the field. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so, and I did my, you know, I did my best, but I really, looking back on it, I should have just cut my losses and tried to run all of my things off the board as fast as possible just to get those five secondary points uh, to try to place a little bit better at the end. Yeah. But uh, I ended up, I ended up trying to chase them as best as I could. Um, and I got a couple, I got a couple additional points. It was probably going into round three. It was probably something like, uh, like three to five. But at that point, you kind of can see the writing on the wall, and and um, you know, I just he finished it off. He he took my war band. I think he wiped me because I wasn't trying to run off at that point because there were no additional points for me to get. Sure. And uh, great player, uh, you know, he deserved to to move on. Um, it it really was tough not having both of my thunder fists or my yeti on the table in round one. On round one, I had a thunder fist, a nobbler, and um, uh, I think two other nobblers on the table. If I did it, no, I had a Thunderfist, a nobbler, and a Yeti, and a nobbler. That's what I did have that on the table, I think. But uh, it was tough. I couldn't get around the map, but he obviously could very well with that gets list. You could kind of control the field, right. so it gave him gave him a really good win. Um, and I'm happy he got it because he's a great player. Um, I would have liked to gotten a little bit of secondary points, but that's okay. It was still. Still good match. Cool. So then, uh, Justin, that means that you played the spiders. Oh, and let me tell you, this was not the this was not the mission to match up with the spiders with my stormcast list, right? <clears throat> because oh, really? I had I would five. Think that Scour would be one of the best missions to go against spiders, because um, you get points for each spider you kill, right? You do, but they also have a base movement of seven with a twist in there. So where they line up, they oh, can double move one. off the board Kirk. almost immediately. Yeah, I mean, like they, yeah. So anyway, um, ours five Stormcast Eternals versus fifteen models. <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty funny. Okay. Yeah. So um, I had tried to position them as best as I could, um, and uh, he basically in each deployment had four spiders, uh, and one of them had three spiders. Uh, and then he had like one hero there, one hero there, and two heroes and another one. So um, he was pretty evenly deployed, you know. Um, I I tried to play kind of a zone defense, uh, especially with the protectors. I had the three-inch bubble. Yeah. But I made a mistake my very first round, and I didn't realize how costly it would be until it was like too late. Because um, what I did is I had moved my protectors up, but he, you know, up towards the spiders, I should have moved them back towards the the end of the board table. Um, because what happened is he, when I moved him up, he just double moved his spiders past me and I was yeah. never catching them again. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so he, yeah, so he double moved them and he was like two inches away from the board. So next activation, they're off, they're off, they're off, you know? Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't get to them at that point. So my, um my protectors actually did not do anything in that game because he just was able to run, run past them. Um, my prosecutor, um, was able to tie down a bunch of other spiders and a, uh, doom weaver. Uh, and he killed a bunch of spiders like boom, 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 boom. Right. So he was knocking them out. And then where my Lord Relictor and Paladin came on, on the other side of the board, they were knocking out a bunch of spiders over there too. Um, and what ended up happening is he got a triple, he rezzed a spider. They ended up killing my prosecutor. They ran off the board there. Um, after I killed a bunch of models, he ran off the board there. And then my, my guys were able to like, there's nobody else on the board. So they just ran to their edge. Right. So the end score ended up being 10 to 11. So he got 11 points. I got 10 points. It was it was a lot closer than I thought it was going to be, um, given the amount of models in their movement, right? Like, had the spiders been move four, I think I would have, like, 
been able to do something about it. But when they were removed seven for that first round and they just double moved, that's 14 inches. It's hard not to stop them from getting off the board. Right. So, um, but listen, it's against Ryan Johnson. He's part of that Dayton war club. Yep. Um, war gaming club. Um, he, he knows his list. He's played this mission several times. He's play tested it. Like the, the man knew what he was doing. He's an excellent player. I mean, spoiler alert. He ended up winning the entire tournament. Um, and, uh, but you know, like it was, it was, I thought it was close, which like with Stormcast, I felt pretty good about, pretty good about it. Um, I ended up with five secondary points on that because I left with half my, uh, army. So, Okay. You know, a loss with half my army. So the first round, I got 21 points, like the max secondary. The second round, Riley had killed my leader, but I still had more than half of my warband at one. So I got 20. So I was at 41, and this made me 46. And I think at this point, Jason, you were at 36? Yeah. Is what we yeah, figured? 36, yep. Yeah, secondary points. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that was I Scour. Al- I almost wonder if Scour would be more fun if, it was like at the start of round or at the start of round three, you can leave the board or something, something like that versus just right off the bat. If you can get to the edge board, you're gone. Cause I think yeah. the way it's written is if you end a move within one inch of the board edge, you escape and you, you score a point, which you can start like, you know, it's turn one, you can start and you can just start running people off the board. If you have a really fast war band. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to be honest. I had this as part of the Nova packet. Um, as like one of the ones after playing it, I don't know if I actually like it that much as a tournament, as a tournament game. And, um, you know, granted, like I ended up losing if I won, I don't know if I would feel any different, but it just felt like, uh, if you're playing against a fast army, you're just going to lose. And I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's like in the spirit of a good tournament pack. You know, it, it just rewards one characteristic so well. So, that's my thought. It can be look tough, at it. though, because, like, favoring a characteristic? some of them, like, Fleeting Glory, I think, like, when I played against Soul Blight, it was, like, their move three doesn't hurt them because they can still get to the objective. Um, yeah. And so there's just no way to beat Soul Blight Grave Lords. And, like, it can't be done because, like you can't punish them for their movement for their bad movement. So it's like, if you're playing against a slow war band, you're going to lose. Um, right. So I do think it, it's tough because, you know, like I really like the variety of missions, but yeah, different missions really, really favor other war bands, but it's good to hear. It's good to hear your perspectives on it for me. Cause like, I really like scour, but I'm realizing maybe I like scour because I went to Depticon like, planning for scour where i had a bunch of giant rats i had um, right. the plan of you take your storm theme and your dagger and then it moves up and it sits on their i can't remember or it sits on their shield yep yep their shields deployment group and then their shield has to deploy in combat with your storm fiend and your storm fiend can just destroy their entire warband uh at the start of round two um yeah. And so I kind of had like a a plan for it, which now I'm wondering like uh, maybe that's kind of a gimmicky plan, and it shouldn't be so easy to uh, to exploit a mission like that. Um, well, and <laughs> so and to hearing be, I mean, it to from be someone fair, else's point of yeah. view, I think is important. And to be fair, that's kind of what I did with my prosecutor, right? My prosecutor was in my dagger, so I threw him up in that area right there. Right, right. Um, it's and, a really and, nice little exploit you can do with your dagger there, yeah. Yeah, and had I moved my hammers backwards instead of, or, you know, my which were my pros, uh, protectors backwards instead of forwards, I think it would have been a different game. Um, but still, like, I don't know. He had, you know, and again, I, I chose, I, I, I drew spiders, right, which is a horde army that's really fast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> so, interestingly, <laughs> with this tournament, uh, spiders move to... Uh, 15 and three in um, competitive tournaments that I've that people have told me about. So yeah. 15 and three is a pretty insane win percentage. Um, yeah, yeah. Can't wait to uh, say goodbye to 1.0 points system. 
<laughs> soon enough. But you guys played a fourth round. Um, I think we we'd did. be remiss, even though you were no longer in contention for winning the tournament. Uh, you did have one final round. Uh, Justin, how'd yours go, and who'd you play again? So I, um, because I, 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 I kind of did the mental math, and I realized that I was the top of the two and one um, group, right? Um, and so, <laughs> in other words, I knew I was going to beat Jason. So, well, <laughs> no, so, <laughs> and I think Jason was like right behind me um, with it because we ended up playing. Um, so. He basically did, um, or maybe you weren't right behind me, but um, I ended up playing the lowest two-one guy um, in terms of secondary points. So it ended up being um, Cipher Lords. I played against Cipher sure. Lords, and um, like they had some, they had their like you know teleport gimmick that they had, and this was a, the this mission was the um, trophy kills. So I had my paladin and my lord relictor as my um, as my two two uh, trophy kills, uh, th and that was kind of the twist of this m modification. Is yep. instead of choosing one, uh, or no, was it trophy kills or was it blood? It was something blood. It was blood something where you pick a you pick a, a blood model. Marked. Yeah, it was you blood pick marked. a model. The, I think oh, the original was where you pick one model. model. Yeah. They modified it to pick two for our tournament. I actually liked that they oh, did interesting. Two. I did too. Okay. This was a really fun one. Um, so, yeah, sorry. It wasn't trophy kills. It was blood marked. And so um, I chose my Relictor and my Paladin. And I chose the Paladin because I was like, please come to him. Like, <laughs> he is ready to do some damage. Right. You know? So, uh, and the Relictor had 32 wounds instead of everybody else's 20. Right? So, um uh, look, this was, I, for lack of a better term, it was a massacre of the <laughs> okay. poor cipher, the cipher lords. Uh, I my paladin ended up dying, which kind of surprised me. But it's because one of his guys rolled triple crits, um, and got like something like eighteen wounds after he had taken four previously. You know, from yep. a bunch of guys. So, um, so it did like a crazy ton of damage on that, on the triple crits. And I was like, okay, well he died. And then just like my prosecutor came in, my protectors came in and it was just like death and blood everywhere. So, um, <laughs> I felt, I felt kind of, I felt kind of bad because it was just so lopsided. Like he kept trying to swing and just was not hitting anything. And so like, he'd be like, oh, I don't have enough movement to get there. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you do. Just go ahead. You know, like, cause I just wanted to kind of like make him feel like he could do something you know um, uh, he's two and one playing for three and one you don't gotta yeah <laughs> so yeah but like it was it was just it was ugly yeah. um and yeah and he was playing it well it's just that the cypher lords just didn't have an answer for the for the stormcast sure. so um so i i won that pretty handily uh 21 points so i ended up walking away with um Let's see, 21, 42, 62, 67 secondary points um, there. So, All right. Uh, yeah. And then, yep. uh, Jason, what was what was your final round? My final round was with um, uh, against Sylvaneth and a really, really cool guy who actually we were talking a lot afterwards. His army was painted very well. In fact, he run best paint. Um, yeah, it was really good. Okay. Gorgeous. Um, and he, actually, we were talking about it afterwards, and he has a... Do you remember what his Instagram is, Dustin? I'll find it. I'll find it. Yeah. Uh, but he's just started an Instagram page to kind of post. He's done a lot of really cool stuff like, um, you know, modding uh, modding the models with LEDs. And, oh, cool. like I think he's done, like, he's uh, for Legion, he's done some, you know, some of the Jedi folks, and he'll actually put, like, he'll put, like, LEDs in the lightsaber so they're glowing, and then... You know, put it with a battery inside the base, so you can play with the model while the LED is on. It's really, really cool stuff. So when we find his uh, Instagram, we'll share it. But uh, really, uh, really, go ahead. Sorry, it's it's black underscore rain underscore studios. Black rain studios. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, um, he he's played Warcry a little bit, um, and he knew he had a list that I think he said at you know obviously he's going this is round four and I think he wasn't super happy with his list at this point but uh, it was kind of a blowout. Um, he had kind of the base. I felt like it was kind of the base Sylvanus box, 
that we had, yeah. you know, the Huntmaster, uh, some Tree Revenants, uh, a Shade Stalker, and I don't remember what the other guys are called. But uh, they had a lot of models on the table, but once again, kind of squishy. Um, didn't do a lot of damage. So you didn't um, have a lot of the Underworlds models. Sounds yeah. Like. Not, okay. Uh, and uh, so, so really, he picked kind of, you know, he picked two of his hunters to be the um, to, to be the the marked. And um, I just uh, I played a movement, you know, I used the Yeti bounce a lot to yep. kind of jump and chase and grab him and keep him from moving. And then I would step out and I got a, um, I think I did get a quad on rampage, which a quad with one of my thunder fists just melted his uh, one of his guys off the board and then i just took the other one this was actually an interesting one where you're whittling down on one of his guys he's almost dead but you just i just didn't get enough points and then the next activation one of my little nobblers just ran up and hit him for a crit and took him out so i'm like well the nobbler uh nobbler finished the tournament out for me (laughs) but uh good good um really friendly guy really excellent painter um what knew he had a list he was kind of not super happy with um it was kind of at the end of the day where everybody's mind's a little exhausted so uh i don't think we did we didn't go too many rounds um in but uh, you know i think my hardest obviously my hardest match i think my hardest match was round two the carrot and overlords i think the gloom spike gets match was just kind of a i just got you know peter played really well with all those hoppers and all those quads it wasn't yeah, really a hard just, match person you start per behind se. Yeah. and it's like you don't have tough decisions you're just starting behind yeah, yeah, you're just starting behind. But the the Keratin Overlords with Justin O was really that was the that was the one that made me think the most of okay, I can't I can't be baited. I got to pay attention. But uh, the Sylvan, the last round four was fun. I think I ended, you know, I ended three and one with uh, let's see, it would be uh, fifty seven. Yeah, I think it was yeah, my I think you were ten points. behind me. Yep. Yeah, cool. and then the, and then the honorable mention obviously is like. Uh, uh, Ryan Johnson and Peter, I, Peter M. I'm not going to try to pretend to say his last name. It's like Mersavinajaj, something just like pre- that. You just did. I know. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, Peter, uh, Peter and uh, Ryan, like that went down to the wire, man. Oh, my gosh. Oh, like, yeah. It was an two, intense fight. Whoa. Like it like they were like dodging each other. And like it was a real chess match between them. I mean, and you know, it, it's a good you know, it's a good match when the uh, tournament runner is clearing off all of the other boards because all the other matches are done, but that table one is still sitting there and everyone's sweating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was really good. Um, Ryan ended up winning it all. Obviously, first place. Um, he did great. Peter, um, I had a chance to leapfrog Peter for second place if he didn't perform that well, but he ended up getting. Um, the same points I did. He got five points, which I did um, the same on uh, my round three against uh, Ryan as well. Um, except he got max points his second round. So the secondary points, he ended up getting 68, and I got 67. So he mm. got second place, and I got third place there um and then i think the idk guy got fourth place and then jason you were fifth yeah okay so um that's how it worked out there so uh overall though i thought it was a great event i had so much fun playing playing it um it was just great to have that many people playing warcry together you know it was so much fun wow good times yeah yeah so that's that's awesome. That's if not the farewell to 1.0, it's pretty close. I know. Yeah. Um, I heard about a tournament in Kansas that is also going to be in 1.0 rules either the end or the weekend after. But yeah, pretty exciting. Um, kind of fun to, to say goodbye, and also cool to see uh, spiders get one last, one last kind of <laughs> look at the trophy um, before right. before the nerf bat comes for them. <laughs> um, I, I the thing I, the thing that I, one of my takeaways from this is like it's so interesting because you'll see us post like Warren who uh, is active in the Discord obviously the Warcry Discord and yeah. um, on the Facebook page um, he posted like the results of the tournament and you had so many people being like what I thought this game was a narrative game 
Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Really? And I'm just like, like this tournament proved that this is absolutely a competitive game if you want it to be. You know, like there's there's all the things that make this a competitive game. There's all the list building tactics. There's all the objective games. There's all the secondary point tactics that you have to play that you would in an Age of Sigmar, that you would in 40K, that you would in Kill Team. Right. You know, and it's it's so funny to me that it's like you've got, you know, 40K and Kill Team. You have Age of Sigmar, Warcry. And those three are all considered competitive games, but Warcry seems to be like, oh, nope, that's the narrative one. And it just doesn't make sense to me because this is absolute, this can absolutely be a very competitive game. And I think it's a lot of fun too, yeah. you know, in this competitive state. And keep listening to us about it because we are now a combined nine and three in Warcry tournaments, <laughs> which is a pretty sweet record for the podcast. What do you guys that think? Is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're all three and one. Yeah, it's pretty great. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you what list did you take to uh, Depticon? Uh, I took Skaven, so I was on yeah. mostly Pestilence. I didn't have that many giant rats; only four giant rats because I wanted uh -huh. uh, more of the kind of lead from the back hitting power of um, you know getting those clouds of um, plague monks because you know once you have leads from the back on them, they can they can kill anything because of that five crit. Um, yeah. But yeah, and then I had the one storm fiend as well. Right on. Um, I it's it's uh it's interesting because I think Skaven, based on the what I saw this weekend, um, I don't I wouldn't consider them like an S tier army. I think that they're uh, maybe a low A or low A high B maybe. Yeah, anything uh, without a big flyer is yeah. not at the top. And um, and really no ranged either, right? So uh, I don't think you need ranged. I think if you have speed, you don't need ranged. Um, That's true. That's a good but, point. But but ranged helps, and it with ranged you don't need speed. Or if you've got both, like uh, Jason had, that's always good to have too. But yeah. um, but yeah, anything without like yeah, thunder fists to me like count as big ten inch move flyers. Like they do kind of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, prosecutors. Yeah. Um, I think that Iden SD player had a um, like a few kills, which are yep. big ten inch flyers. So really, you know, I'm looking at the top five, like the five three and one or four and zero oh players, and the only list that didn't have a you know they're an artillery piece or a big flyer is uh, the tarantulas, which just have the back of you know spiders being completely broken so yeah um, yeah definitely i think kind of the capstone uh of 1.0 is you need you need that big flyer or a big artillery piece something that something that can reach out across the board and kill something um like right away so yeah and i think i think one of our future episodes when we kind of discuss tactics um is how like how to plan for your abilities right because I noticed I thought about this during the tournament is that I really only had four abilities to use from my list of abilities and that included my leader stuff, but that's all I needed. Right. Like, and, and when I did those things, I did them very well. Um, yeah. and so I've, tr I've planned other lists to like maximize mm -hmm. and like, Oh, well I could use this double or that double or that double or that double. And sometimes it's too broad, right? Because I don't get it. Ma I, I, I don't maximize that. So, yeah, if you just have uh, that one might be double and topic. one triple that you like, I find you don't need more than two. It's nice to have yep. more than two. It's nice to have three or four, but uh, you can get away with only having two. Yeah. So. You know, you know, one, um, I found that as well, just to confirm. Like, I really just had a double, and I basically had a double and a quad, but I spent most of my stuff with doubles. Yeah, You know, me with too. the, uh, really, and doubles are so easy to come by, you know. I, I found myself many times just... Make taking my wild dice just to make an extra double so I'd have the flexibility. Yeah, I mean that ogre list so terrifying when you get three doubles in a round because then you can use your yeti and both your thunder fists, all getting their doubles. That's always pretty scary. Yep. Yep. So uh, stuff. so out with the old, I think. Yep. And, absolutely. Uh, let's go in with the new. Um, what do you guys want to talk about first with this new edition? There's so much to so much to get into. Uh, should we just let's, like 
quick yeah, go ahead. lightning round on our thoughts on the box? Uh, yes. Now that it, like we we got a good look at it and all that stuff, yeah, let's do lightning round on it. Jason, what do you think of the box? In fact, we saw like an in-person display at Gen Con of the terrain and the models and stuff like that. And oh, cool. um, for the record... I was not impressed with GW's painting of the models. <laughs> like, it Called looked like somebody had gotten the box and, like, holy crap, we need to speed paint these tonight. Oh, you like, know? this wasn't so. the heavy metal version no. of the models. This was, like, a local GW store needing to showcase it right away. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly what it looked like to me. But, you know, that's me being kind of petty and picky. <laughs> <laughs> So, Jason, what did you, what did you think of the the terrain and models and all that? Yeah, if we're just talking about the box, um, not the rules yet, I will say I was present, uh, pleasantly surprised that I with my own feelings about the terrain. Um, I think uh, when I saw all of the terrain there on the board, and they have you know, now they have the full box pictures, it looks it looks good to me. Like it looks like a right, um, the right amount of terrain to play a skirmish game on. I was worried at first, but I think it's cause I didn't see the full kind of the full picture with all of the terrain out there. Um, I, I, I think from a visual perspective, it looks, it's going to be challenging to come up with a paint scheme that I think I'm satisfied with for like kind of the bamboo. Uh, sure. there's a lot of bamboo, right? Um, but I, I really look at it and I think this is going to make for a fun, uh, different feel versus just you know the old mausoleum or the broken down columns and stuff like that. It, it's going to be cool to play in kind of this uh, kind of swampy, swampy deadwood area. So I, 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 it was visually stimulating to me. I, I second what Justin said. Like we we barely found the display at Gen Con. And, you know, <laughs> that's it's so like true. We barely found it. We're like, hey, what's that in the corner over there? You know, in the glass corner. And sure enough, there it was, just kind of crammed into the display, <laughs> all by itself. So, so I, I kept I kept saying to Jason, I'm like, why does GW hate its own game I so know. much? <laughs> you know, because it's like here it is, like they're taking pre-orders, like 2.0 is coming out, and they have this tiny aquarium style glass case. <laughs> like in this huge they had a huge footprint gw did they were running kill team demos they were running like they had like um had the horus heresy uh, giant battle yeah giant horus heresy battle going on they had like all these models that they're selling they had all this stuff and like little tiny war cry section like not even a section it was just like one little display i'm like man like you guys are really not hitting the uh hitting the iron while it's hot here you know so it's just kind of funny yeah, I mean, so, it's funny how they've got, talked about these tournaments and not even mentioned that Warcry will be there. You know, like the uh, Nova advertisement yeah. that they said that, you know, come play Kill Team AOS and 40K, even though they're in the middle of a Warcry um, release. And it's like, don't even mention the Warcry tournament you're running. Um, that was pretty <laughs> like, interesting. Uh, there's got to be two different teams that love two different games up there in, in Nottingham. You know what I mean? Because I don't yeah, know what's absolutely. going on, you know? Although I did so. hear that uh, that the tournament director for Gen Con sort of uh, browbeat the official G-Dub folks into giving them a whole bunch of prize support, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah, he did. It was pretty funny, like, hearing him talk. He's like, you think you might want to, like, you know, throw a little something in the pot? And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, let's get you something. <laughs> <laughs> so... That's pretty good. That's um, good. Um, but yeah, I, I second what Jason said. Like um, looking at the models, um, I really like the like the Rottmeyer Creed models. We talked about them before, but seeing them kind of in person and with the bamboo, like it feels so thematic. So I'm excited to I'm excited to kind of dig into that box and really put those on the table. I think it'll I think it'll look and feel very different. And um, hopefully with like the new terrain rules, that'll that'll play a little bit differently too. We got a little flavor of that with um, like Red Harvest, right? With the with the um, sluices and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I think this will be more interesting. Yeah, I saw the Watchtower has really interesting rules where if you get up onto the Watchtower, you can uh, bring one model from up in early, which. You know, could be potentially a really uh, powerful advantage and something worth 
So I'm glad that they're kind of thinking of rules that actually encourage you to terrain. Because yeah. with Red Harvest, uh, all the rules say if you use the terrain, if you climb on the terrain, you get punished. And so there's just this massive incentive to just avoid all this nice terrain that they've made for you, uh, which I right. thought from a rules perspective was pretty bad. But at least personally on the box, I uh, also really like the Nurgle guys. Um, they just do something for Nurgle that I've never seen before as far as the kind of shape of it, the style. I really love that. Um, I don't know how much I love the rest of the box, but um, I love well, the Well, you know how I feel about the head, the head horns. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you think that that's going to... Do you think that GW is going to struggle to sell this box? I do. Um, it's kind of a I, shame. I kind of think they are too. But I just think if you want to get into Warcry, unfortunately, the box is not the best way to do it. Um, right. You know, like there are... Red Harvest is still available or cheaper than this box is with, um, you know, it's objective what terrain is better. It's all about kind of what you enjoy. But like... The have more than enough terrain for a board where this box just has exactly one board's worth of terrain. Uh, right. So you don't really have the flexibility with this box, whereas in Red Harvest you have you know, tons of terrain that you can set up on a board any which way, and you can make all sorts of boards with terrain. And uh, with this box you just have the one that it looks pretty good, but it's just one board. Um, yeah, it's not as dynamic for sure. Yeah. And... And I mean, you can go out and you can buy the Azerite ruins, right? The Warcry Azerite ruins for like a hundred dollars. Yeah, and, those are great. And yeah, it's awesome. I mean, you can build a, a like you said, like a bunch of different kinds of boards with that, right? So there's a hundred dollars for that. You could go out and buy two warbands for somewhere between forty and sixty dollars, depending on which ones you want. And all of a sudden, you've got a like complete set for less than this box. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, and you know, there's better and better brain out there. Um, the one place I would say that the box is worth it is if you are not just new to Warcry, but also new to war game, and it's like this box gives you dice, it gives you Bendy Ruler, which is the best type of ruler, it gives you, you know, all the cards you play, like. If if you're like if this is your first entry into wargaming, I think it's an amazing box. But if you've gotten any start at all, I think you better um, grabbing the pieces. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, like it was with the first box that came out, it was nice because it had the cards, the dice, the ruler, right? The two right. the two war bands, like all that stuff. And um, I I don't know if this box is going to attract the new i don't know i don't know maybe I, i've seen a lot of people been like hey warcry is really interesting me right now like i might get the box you know so um i think that the f believe it or not i think that the free rules preview or not preview but the free rules drops for each of the war bands will help sales i agree um, i think that the free and we may as well go into these free yeah, pdfs that we've yeah. got these free pdfs i think are you know the best thing that games workshops ever done uh rules yeah. wise and i do think for me they gave me more hype than um the box did i went out and for sure. bought two war bands um just based on being so excited for these rules i was like well i'm i'm already pretty sort of upset with how the box was put together and sold so what if i just spend the money i was going to spend on the box on just two war bands that i'm excited about from reading these three rules and so i did that and you know, Games Workshop, even if they're not going to sell the box and they'll never find out that those AOS sales were because of Warcry, you know, the, the money they made off of the, those free PDFs is pretty real. Yeah, and you had a lot of people who are like, I don't know if I'm going to keep going with Warcry, I don't know. And then all of a sudden they're like, what's this? <laughs> yeah. You know, free, <laughs> free, I don't have to buy the compendium? Because that was giving a lot of players heartburn, especially after they went out and bought the faction books right like right they're like oh, i just bought these a little while ago and then i just bought the tome of champions for the points updates and all this stuff and now i've got to go buy a compendium 
And the hilarious so. thing is these free PDFs are goodwill because I'm going to eventually buy the book compendium anyway just for convenience because, yeah. you know, I hate putting my laptop into tablet mode and I don't have a separate tablet. So, <laughs> you know, doing the PDFs yeah. as a tablet is just not that convenient. So I'd rather have the book. Um, so at least for me, that's, you know, it still works for them. But uh, yeah. I, I've heard that the rumor is that the only reason we actually got the free PDFs was that they had um, some sort of catastrophic accident with sort of supply chaining on the uh, compendium itself, but I don't know wow. how much that's true. Um, and did you, have you heard rumors about the core rules? Are, you, are they releasing those as a PDF? So in their email newsletter, they said that they would. However... Yeah. As of recording, it's Wednesday the 10th, and I guess I would have assumed that we would have received them by now. Maybe they'll wait until the box releases, or maybe the week after the box releases. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, I do expect to see them for free online if they said they would, but who knows? I don't know. Yeah. But let's get yeah. into those rules. What is there? Is there any like one rule change that you guys are excited about? One, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I've dug through all of them enough to know that. I like. I'll say. I say. I will. I like the reactions. I was yeah. worried about them. I like that they eat up one of your activation or one of your actions in a character's activation. Um, I hope that we figure the bookkeeping out on that so that we don't accidentally give people a reaction and then later in the turn when it is their turn, accidentally give them two actions. Uh, we'll have to make sure that we kind of stay on top of that. But I do like that you can take a reaction, but it does eat into one of your actions when you activate that unit. I think that I think they did well with that. I'm excited to see how that plays out. Yeah, it goes back to last month we recorded when they had shown what, what reactions are, but we didn't know anything about the rules. Yeah, we didn't know their cost. Yeah, we had this conversation. They have to cost something, and I think that yeah. what they did for the cost is, is solid. Yeah, I think so too. I I uh, am a little I've you know Jess and I on the on the long drive to Gen Con we kind of scrolled through some of the different reactions and I am curious to see you know I how they balance out uh, given that each warband has different abilities and different point costs I know that goes into the consideration when they make the reactions but some of the reactions seem like. Super dumb compared to other reactions. <laughs> from other warbands. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think when you're looking at the reactions, the first question to ask is, is this better or worse than the universal ones? Right? Like, that's the first standard by which you should judge whether or not this is a good reaction or not. And I think some are really good. Some are about the same as the, as the universal ones, and some are demonstrably worse. Right, so um, I think I think there's a, a good mix in there, um, and and for the record, Dan has uh, here has broke down on his YouTube channel each of the factions based on these PDFs that came out, and I believe Dan, you go through each of these reactions and kind of compare them to the universal ones and how they work with those warbands. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because I do think they've made an effort with some of the reactions that are obviously good to um, sort of nerf the profiles of the, the fighters in those warbands that would be really good with those reactions. Right. Um, right. So like the Skaven one, uh, you can give a free disengage or a free move or, you know, any of your buddies nearby at the cost of your own action. So you could say, take a plague monk or a pack master and then give your storm fiend or your rat ogre free disengage so that then it can go somewhere else. Or you give your leader a free disengage so that your opponent can't kill it and stop you from getting your lead from the back going. Um, so that's really, really powerful, but then they just obliterated Skaven in terms of their points <laughs> um, like as a punishment for it, you know, like just total 
warfare on all of the points of every model that costs less than 120 points. Um, just because I think they decided, you know, we can't... If Skaven's running around with 40-point giant rats that can take the action to uh, all of a sudden give an ac a free disengage to a leader, uh, it's going to be impossible to ever kill any any big target right. Skaven model. So they just, like, they made the points on all of the cheap Skaven fighters, like, completely unplayable um, because they decided that this reaction was incredible. Now, maybe when I play my Skaven, I'll realize that the reaction is so good that just having all your cheap rats just be awful. It's worth it as long as you've got enough rat ogres around. But, um, yeah, it, like it... <laughs> It's really interesting, you know, they, the reactions are unbalanced, but they've turned knobs and, and levers in other places to, to at least try to make up for it. I mean, you know, the, then the rest is just up to us testing and bring out, yep. you know, which, which knobs that they, did they not turn far enough? Right. And, and I think you brought up a good point too, which is like a lot of these reactions are rune marked, right? Well, all of them are. And so there are some models within these factions that cannot use those reactions. Uh, I guess not all of them are rune marked, but some of them are. Yeah, um, so them. like some of them work for minions, some of them work for, you know, um, your elites and things like that. So um, that's important to think too, because when you read those, you're like, oh, wow, this army can do that. Well, maybe only like three models in the army can do that. Sure. So that's important to keep in mind as well. So, um, yeah, I, I'm I'm most curious about how the shooting meta is going to work. Um, and we kind of talked about this a little bit before, but the idea that you can't shoot into melee, um, also giving cover to, you know, units that are on a platform, um, it really kind of hit the shooting people a little bit hard. Um and but I don't know that that will really affect a lot. I mean, Jason, how many times did you shoot into melee in the tournament? Yeah, a we lot? talked about that. Uh, none, yeah. um, none. But <laughs> but uh, to keep in mind, that's because that rule didn't exist. Right. right? So uh, that said, the situations with my shooters, you know, were such that there that was never really needing to shoot into a melee, but. Uh, Maybe it won't come into play that much. Maybe it won't matter. I don't know. So it's yeah. interesting. They they kind of beat up your lead belchers and your and your thunder fists uh, from a points perspective, but they didn't destroy every big artillery piece in the game. Um, so you know, like the judicator that does a million damage, they took the points way up on that. But the judicators that were just like a tiny bit behind it. They left mostly intact, and so there's a few really strong judicators that can kind of do a little bit of a thunderfist impression. And you know, based on what you're saying, Jason, that you didn't even shoot into combat once, I do think that there will be some shooters that are still still usable and still pretty good. Uh, but but they're going to be much more rare. Yeah, I'm curious to see if you can. You know, in oh, here's a question. In 1.0, as long as you're within range, can you use a, I'll call it a missile weapon, if you are engaged, and use it on the person you're engaged with? As long as your profile is like 1 yep. to 8 or yep. whatever. Yep. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, if it's right. a 3 to 10, then you can't. Yeah, but if that it's makes a sense. 1 to 10, you can. Yeah, so then the question is, can you do that in 2.0 if it's just you engaged with the person? Because now you are shooting into melee interesting or is it... i bet you can't I... actually because it well, sounds like technically know. you're shooting in melee so so i think that you can just because like i've seen some of the profiles where like it's a spear and it's range up to eight so right but... i think as long as I, I mean here's my opinion here's my opinion as long as it's just you like one mo your model and the other model engaged i think you can hit them but if it's your model and another model and another model engaged, probably not. I think but, there's going to be some serious rules as written arguments until yes. it comes on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, that'll be that. That will be kind of interesting um, to see how that plays out for sure. So I, you know, what's interesting, uh, Dan, is um, you were talking about prosecutor with the drop in the protectors. Like they got a huge drop in the paladin as well. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I might be able to fit a 
um, adjudicator in that list that I had. Yeah, I think, honestly, I think your protector list is a really great place for people to start if they're wondering where to get started in uh, second edition because it's a list yeah. that was competitive in first edition and dropped in points, right? right. So when yeah. I look at my list that I took to Adepticon and went three and one, if I look at Jason's three and one list, those are both really solid competitive one lists, but both of them went up in points. Um, right yours actually went down so it went down by like 150 points yeah so you know if i was if i was listening to this podcast i would be real interested in kind of taking figuring out what the 2.0 version of your list is because yeah. even the prosecutor that you had like barely went up in points right and yeah went up yeah. by Just way barely. less than what your prosecutor uh, protectors went down by mm-hmm. yeah yep uh, i'm really interested um like one of the things it'll be interesting to see how that it seemed like the tax on points, like the ones that stayed the same or went up a little bit were really penalized because of their movement. That seemed to be the one thing that GW really like focused on of doing. So like, you know, the orcs that I play with, they all drop significantly in points. The storm casted or three inch movement dropped significantly in points, but like giant rats and spiders and those things that have like, you know, six inch movement, like those all went way up in points. Yeah. And it makes me wonder if one of the first places to start testing is to see if, um, you know, to try some of those super low movement lists and see if they over buffed the low movement stuff. And then to maybe try a super fast list. And, you know, did, did they actually go far enough with these points? At least for me, what I'm thinking of is I'm, I'm wanting, at least I'm going to start with a warband that has the backbone of it being really low, but then still has one big flyer in it. Um, even if yeah. you're even if you're paying extra points for that big flyer, uh, you're kind of making up for it by the rest of your list being really low. And I'm going to see yep. see if I can get that to work. Yeah, I've already got a uh, flesh shooter quartz list that has a terrorgeist in it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's a it's a four ghoul terrorgeist, uh, ghoul king, and crypt flare. Oh, oh my gosh. Gosh. I want to see how it plays. The Ghoul King went down in points. Uh, he did. He did. Pretty which is nice. Why he's do that. <laughs> really competitive choice there. Yeah, I was I was sad because I had the Arch Regent and you know the Ghoul King and Arch Regent four were like really evenly matched. The Arch Regent is a little bit more points, but is also a little bit stronger. But now the Ghoul King, you know, still just a little bit weaker, but way less points. Um, so it's like absolutely worth the trade off. To just yeah. like cut down in some stats to get that big down in your points. Yeah. Very sure. good. So yeah, um I'm really excited to see I I got my copy of the box coming out. Um the thing that tipped me over the edge in, in picking it up was that I was getting the core book in the box, right? Because yep. I didn't know when we were gonna be getting a PDF copy, if ever. Um, and so I, I decided to pick it up. It's coming next Wednesday, so I'm pretty excited about that. And um, I'll have it ready for the Nova. So speaking of the Nova, and I think that's maybe where we can end this, um, we are going to be playing with 2.0 rules. And what will happen is if we don't get the if we don't get the PDF copy of the core rules, there will be a basically a sheet in the tournament packet that will have some of the updated rules that we'll play with. So like it might feel like, changes. yeah, so yeah. It'll, it'll probably feel like more like a 1.9 <laughs> instead of a 2.0, <laughs> yeah. you know, because it maybe won't have like, I, I was watching, I was actually watching a, um, uh, a, the Warhammer plus, uh, battle report for Warcry and I had the Rottmeyer Creed playing with the, um, with the horns of Hashut, and one of them in there is you have like resource points at the beginning of the game where they have like three resource points, and you could turn those into wild dice at any point in the game if you wanted to, and like that was something that I I noticed that nobody else had really picked up on. I hadn't seen that anywhere else. I think was and, that one of the twists that's in the new. Oh, box? maybe that was a twist. Maybe that was a twist as they gave them resource points. So I, I, I couldn't tell in the, in the battle report where that came from. I was kind of like half paying attention while I was writing something. And so, um, yeah, but anyway, I, I feel like 
you know, without the core rule book, I may not get uh, all the all the significant changes, but it'll be enough that we'll be playing pretty much a 2.0 game. So I think it'll be good. Cool. So yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Anyway. I'm excited to see what people come up with. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So if you haven't gotten your tickets for the Nova Open yet, um, go check it out, Nova Open 2022. Uh, get in there. Get in the Warcry GT. There's still tickets available. I know I talked to a lot of people who said they had not yet registered. <laughs> Jason? Chop, chop, everybody. <laughs> yep. So get on that. Get in the Warcry GT. We want to get that uh, solidified and, and out there so that people can um, get in and play. So uh, in the meantime, check out the Salty Sea uh, YouTube channel. He's got some amazing breakdowns. Uh, when I say he, I mean you, Dan. Has okay. some amazing breakdowns of all of the factions and, and their um, changes in 2.0. Those spreadsheets that you have are absolutely amazing and uh, really kind of show what's happening. So check those out. Get your new list ready and get some 2.0 games in before uh, the Nova Open. So yeah, with that, uh, everybody have a great night and uh, keep the dice rolling. Yep. See ya. See ya.